Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Kamgar. I'm a medical oncologist at the Medical College of Wisconsin. I have with me two of our amazing experts. I have Dr. Tommy McFall. He is a, a basic scientist. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Biochemistry. His area of expertise is specifically the RAS pathway that we will be talking much more about during this discussion. I have also Dr. Uh, ben George here with me. So Dr. George is a William Stapp uh, Endowed Professor of Medicine um, and the Medical Director of our uh, Clinical Trials Office. He is a brilliant expert in the uh, precision oncology. And our discussion today will be mostly about uh, targeted therapy in pancreas cancer and specifically with a focus on RAS pathway and KRAS. So what I will do is I will start uh, first um, with Dr. George. So Dr. George, uh, what is targeted therapy? First of all, Dr. Kamgar, thank you for doing this. Such a pleasure to be here with you and, and Dr. McFall. Um, so targeted therapy really relies on the idea that you are using a treatment directed at a specific target within or on the cell surface for the most part. It's important to recognize that cancer cells evolve from normal cells in the body. And as the cancer cells develop, there are some changes that occur within the gene that either drives the cancer and lets the cancer cell be what it is. Mm -hmm. And the fundamental idea of targeted therapy is, can we leverage that change that occurred when the normal cell became the cancer cell and use that as a therapeutic vulnerability? Meaning, mm -hmm. can we find the target on the cancer cell that is not present on the normal cell and use that as a target to guide treatment? The advantage would be twofold. Mm -hmm. Number one, you have a specific target to work on the cancer cell. And two, you're sparing the normal cells from the side effects of treatment. Mm -hmm. So that sums up targeted therapy, if you will. And then how is it different from chemotherapy? Yeah, you know, chemotherapy um, gives medical oncologists a bad reputation, doesn't it? Um, so historically, we have relied on chemotherapy, which is not very specific, right? Mm -hmm. What that means is chemotherapy is meant to attack cells in the body that are dividing rapidly, mm -hmm. which means that it is going to preferentially attack the cancer cells. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it is going to attack some of the normal cells in the body as well. Mm -hmm. So even though you get cancer cell kill, there is some collateral damage to the normal cells in the body that occurs. Chemotherapy is still the mainstay of treatment for various cancers, including pancreas cancer. However, we are looking at targeted therapies as an option to, number one, specifically target the cancer cells and mitigate the toxicities that come from chemotherapy, if you will. Great. So I think my first, my second question would be from Dr. McFall. So our discussion today is about KRAS and RAS pathway. What is RAS pathway? What is KRAS? And why is it important in pancreatic cancer? Yeah, so RAS is a protein in the cell found near the membrane, and it acts as a switch. So um, typically a healthy cell will get a signal from outside the cell which turns on this switch. So it's kind of like, the way I describe it is a, a light with a, you know, a timer. It's, it, it's on, but it, it slowly turns off. And that, that switch is really important because it signals for a cell to grow and divide and survive, right? And a lot of cancers, um, 90, over 90% 90 of pancreatic cancers have a mutated RAS. And that mutation actually makes that switch stuck on. So the light never turns off. It's always on. So it's always, you know, proliferating and growing. And that's um, it's a big problem. So we call this an oncogene. And mm -hmm. uh, it really pushes the progression of, um, you know, cancer growth and development. And uh, honestly, without a mutant RAS, it would be very hard to make pancreas cancer. So it's almost required. Mm -hmm. So it's a very strong driver. And you mentioned uh, 90 to 95 percent have it. So, are there tumors that don't have the RAS mutation with pancreas cancer? They, they, there are some that don't. It's very rare, but they have other mutations and other proteins that kind of make up for it. Okay. So. And uh, knowing that RAS is really a driver in a lot of tumors, Dr. George. So, um, it's really 
like it makes us think that okay we can target that and this will address the tumor and will not address the body very great for targeted therapy are we there yet are we able to really target RAS and really control the cancer with that yeah, great question and then thank you Dr. McFall for really explaining how RAS can lead to carcinogenesis um, in, in pancreas cancer so targeting RAS effectively would be considered the next frontier in cancer treatment um, more so in pancreas cancer because again 90% of these cancers tend to have uh, alterations in the RAS gene that drive the cancer forward however the, the challenge is many fold okay. um, and, and there are some early gains that we have made in the space and there are a lot of clinical trials underway and, and hopefully we will make some meaningful impact in the next many years now, as you can imagine KRAS as a gene um, has many aspects to it and there are many changes that occur in the gene all of those changes will likely have a different impact on cancer signaling mm -hmm. and therefore how the cancer behaves and therefore we need to think of each of these changes as individual changes and, and how do you attack them um, and as you know quite well, there is a specific change in KRAS called the KRAS G12C mutation mm -hmm. that has garnered a lot of attention in recent years um, due to a targeted therapy that is now FDA approved mm -hmm. specifically for lung cancer. Mm -hmm. Again, very important to keep in mind that the context of the cancer is very, very important, meaning how the, sp the same KRAS G12C mutation behaves in pancreas cancer is different from how it behaves in colon cancer or lung cancer mm -hmm. and I say that because the efficacy signal or the effectiveness that was seen in lung cancer with that particular drug that targeted KRAS G12C was not seen so much in colon cancer mm -hmm. and there are some early data available in pancreas cancer showing that yes it is indeed effective but we still need larger data sets to prove that this is indeed the case. Mm -hmm. The second thing to keep in mind, of course, is G12C only comprises only about 1-2% to 2 of pancreas cancer. And as you both know quite well, there are um, a lot of studies underway looking at other specific changes in pancreas cancer, specifically the G12B mutation, which is the most common mutation in RAS in pancreas cancer. So my hope is that, you know, as a, as a medical community uh, in the next many years we'll have enough to talk about in terms of effective ways to target RAS if you will. So my next question is from you Dr. McFall. Mm -hmm. So a lot of uh, research that you do really relies on KRAS presence absence but also more importantly about as Dr. George was saying one important thing is that whether it's in which cancer origin of it is long or different the other question is that whether there are different KRAS mutations, whether the KRAS can get activated in different manners and whether that means a different biology. And I think a lot of your expertise relies on that. So how is it, explain a bit about what are different KRASs and how does your research is trying to explore and look at that? Yeah, well, I mean, as Dr. George was explaining, you have to think about it. There's a lot of alterations that can occur in that gene, right? Um, Roughly, you know, uh, there's four main players in pancreatic cancer, um, but overall, 21 can exist. So there's about 21 different RAS mutations that do exist and are probably oncogenic from what we understand. They all behave differently. Um, and that's really important in understanding how to treat the disease. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, when we see a mutation in cancer, like a KRAS mutation, that's just part of the story. Um, there's actually a large portion of normal protein as well. Mm -hmm. So, and what we're finding out in my laboratory is that the, the mutant can actually be a bad influence on the normal proteins in the same cell. Mm -hmm. So this guy's overactive and always on, and it can actually leave these guys on too. Mm -hmm. So the way we have to look at it is more of a, a really simple math problem. You know, it's parts of a whole. Um, so in colorectal cancer, we know that there's a lot of what we call wild type normal protein next to the mutant, right? Mm -hmm. And they're both active. So depleting just the mutant is not enough. You need to get the wild type too. 
Um, in lung cancer, we know that the proportion of mutant is higher than the wild type significantly. Um, specifically in the G12C case that Dr. George was talking about, that's why the monotherapy worked much better in lung cancer than colorectal cancer. Mm -hmm. um, in pancreatic cancer, what we're finding in our new studies here with you is that, you know, there's a significant wild type population in pancreatic cancer cells too, which we mm -hmm. have to think about. Um, so it's not as simple as we have an actual biomarker, the mutant of interest and the drug of choice. Just because you have a drug that can target your mutant is actually not enough in some cases. You need to use combination approaches, and that's what the clinical trials groups are doing. They're doing multiple drugs to mm -hmm. get different en ends of the pathway. So mm -hmm. that's really the way that everybody's starting to move and think about as we develop these new drugs. And you have some research called system biology. Mm -hmm. What is that? How does it help figuring out, how is it improving like targeted therapies? Yeah, so historically, um, we as biochemists really focus on a really specific singular problem, right? And it could be as simple as, does the mutant turn off or on, you know, and we think about it and we study that very, very deeply. Um, and systems biology really is thinking about the system, that, you know, the, the pathway itself. There's multiple players in which this protein talks to, and systems biology just incorporates all that mm -hmm. and looks at the signal strength overall. So, you know, instead of focusing on the one bad acting child in the classroom only, we're looking at how that child influences all the other children in the classroom, you know, which can be a very different dynamic. Mm -hmm. So, and that's really what systems biology is. We're taking all the players and considering them together. Mm -hmm. Great. So, Dr. George, um, I want to talk to you about a study that you have here, a very promising study called I Predict. It really utilizes a lot of our knowledge and our best available um, medications as of now to try to really um, move this phase of targeted therapy forward. Can you tell us a bit more about this study? What is it and what do you do in this study? Yeah, you know, we're glad you brought up the study. This is a study where, you know, both of you have contributed significantly and, and we partnered to, to run the study. Um, I think something that Dr. McFall said was really important. You know, systems biology um, also, in, in some ways, is reflective of precision oncology, right? Um, because we think about the right treatment for the right patient. Mm -hmm. And we know that people are inherently different. Therefore, the cancers are likely inherently different. Mm -hmm. And the behavior of the cancer is likely dependent on the normal cells from which the cancer grew, the host immune system, the environment in which the cancer grew, and all kinds of crosstalk happening within the cancer cells and around it, if you will. Mm -hmm. So I think it is simplistic to think that one or two drugs can attack a cancer. And it, it brought up the idea that can we design a treatment for a specific cancer based on the biologic blueprint of that particular cancer. Mm -hmm. And that is how iPredict was born with the idea that we look at the specific alterations within an individual's cancer uh, and use all possible tools to study that at a very deep level. Mm -hmm. And then have a group of experts sit around a table and talk about it mm -hmm. and look at the alterations and say, what are the alterations that may be driving this cancer? What kind of treatments can we find that can specifically target the key alterations within that cancer without causing a lot of toxicity? Mm -hmm. And I think the beauty of that meeting is that there are clinic clinical investigators like you and me who participate, mm -hmm. and there are wonderful scientists like Dr. McFall who, who chime in. And this kind of feeds the trial in a way that we design treatments together and that also designs the next set of experiments that'll get, that'll help us to know more about mm -hmm. cancer treatments, if you will. So I predict this in reality, in my mind, an approach or an attempt at precision medicine, trying to find the right treatment for each patient, if mm -hmm. you will. And uh, this study is designed to go on for some years. A lot might change, specifically in the field of RAS treatment, targeted therapy. So how does it adapt to all of these changes? 
Yeah. You know, you, you bring up very, very important points, right? Um, you know, I, I think it is important to recognize, and I think we all know this, but important to highlight the idea that our assays or the tests that we do are historically always a little bit ahead mm -hmm. of the treatments that we generate, mm -hmm. right? Because we generate treatments based on what we know from the tests that we do. Mm -hmm. So that is a historical lag that has always been there and will likely always be there. So when we designed iPredict, we recognize that this is going to be a problem because as we get to know more, then there will be new treatments and how can treatment be fixed? Mm -hmm. right? So we want it to evolve over time. Therefore, we kind of used a strategy um, that, is, that is somewhat evolving over time. Mm -hmm. And we said in the protocol that we will study the, the multi-omics of the tumor. What I mean by that is we can look at the gene, which is called genomics, RNA called transcriptomics, or you know, the epigenome, which is called epigenomics. So there are all kinds of omics out there. And we combine that to say multi-omics as contributing to the cancer behavior, if you will. And therefore, we said, as we wrote the protocol, that we will look at the multi-omic data of a tumor mm -hmm. based on the available assays at that time, mm -hmm. whether it be now or five years from now. And we will look at the available treatments at any given point in time and match the multi-omic data with the available treatments mm -hmm. in the setting of a molecular tumor board mm -hmm. where nobody is making an arbitrary decision. This is going to be um, a decision by committee, by consensus, by very thoughtful people like you, Dr. McFall. Um, and, and that way, I think we can at least try to stay with the evolution of treatments and assays over time. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, absolutely. So I think, Dr. McFaul, I will uh, ask you the last question. I think we talked about a lot of advances in our understanding of the cancer, in our ways or assays of understanding it. We are making some improvements in making the medications. Are you optimistic about the future of pancreas cancer treatment? I am, yeah. I think that we have... Um a lot of cl clinicians and scientists across the entire country really making major contributions. Um, you know, and I mean, they might seem like small steps, but adding them all up together, I think we're starting to see people do better. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll see how this goes, but, you know, there's a clinical trial for a KRAS G12D inhibitor, right? And, um, and there's a big study that just came out showing that, you know, using that with uh, Avast and together uh, works really well in the preclinical models. So that, you know, that shows some promise for patients, a large cohort of pancreas patients, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I think we're starting to go after mutations that are more common in pancreas cancer too. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of efforts are being put towards that. I think the G12C example was just the tip of the iceberg. It was a really important finding to show that we could actually do this because RAS was considered undruggable, mm -hmm. and now we know that we can drug them. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it, we just needed that example to mm -hmm. get everybody fired up, and I think that's where things are going. Great. So I want to just uh, wrap up our discussion here. So a lot is going on with pancreatic cancer, and we are hoping that eventually among these, there will be a breakthrough that will really change the prognosis and our outcomes in pancreatic cancer. And uh, we are really hopeful that we could contribute to that, but there is a huge uh, community of researchers and clinicians that are really trying to improve the pancreatic cancer care. So we hope that this will eventually lead to a change in care, uh, care for our patients with pancreatic cancer. I hope that this video was uh, helpful in um, giving you some introduction to targeted therapy and RAS treatment. And uh, thank you very much for uh, watching this video.